Okay, I want to welcome everyone to the Blackboard Innovative Teaching Series. Today, we'll be, um, we're delighted to, uh, to welcome Cheryl Abshire with Calcutta Parish, who's going to be talking about kicking it up a notch with Blackboard Tools for a Successful Dual Credit Course Program. Before we get started with that, I do want to let everybody know, um, also on the line, there's two of us from Blackboard, myself, Jenny Breister on the marketing team, and Claudine Townley, who's our Senior Customer Success Advocate. Um, a friend to many of you on the line, and uh, she'll be monitoring the chat as well as um, helping with the Q&A. Um, so any questions that she can answer in addition to Cheryl, please feel free to chat away. I also wanted to take this opportunity to um, let you know we are recording this session and, and every BITS webinar in the series is recorded, and you can they're all uh, available to you at our K-12 Blackboard Innovative Teaching Series playlist on our uh, TV YouTube's channel. And I'm gonna go ahead and put that, uh, that link in the chat for you all. Um, so feel free to, to go there at any time, 24-7, um, uh, to take a peek at our, uh, the rest of our series. And you'll also be receiving the recording and the presentation slides from today's session in a few days via email. In addition to the playlist, you're also invited to participate in a professional learning community on our Blackboard community site. So this is a PLC, a professional learning community designed to augment the series and create an avenue for ongoing collaboration and dialogue. So we want you to accept our invitation to join that group and I will put the, the, uh, the link uh, to join the community site in the chat as well in a second. I also wanted to alert you that we do have a couple of more bit sessions um, with our spring uh, series. So please uh, think about joining us for Monday, May 1st and Monday, May 15th, uh, where we've got some really exciting sessions lined up from Montana Digital Academy, as well as from our friends at Lawrence Public Schools. And I'll again put the, uh, the link uh, for you to sign up for the remaining sessions. Also, this summer we've got BB World 17 in New Orleans very close to Ms. Cheryl, and that's happening on July 25th through the 27th. So if you and your colleagues are considering coming to BB World, this is the, the website to, uh, to sign up. We'd, be, we'd look forward to having every one of you at BB World, our annual Blackboard conference. So with that, I want to introduce Cheryl Abshire, Dr. Cheryl Abshire with Calcasieu Parish a School Board, who will be talking about um, how they have been using Blackboard to uh, create a successful dual credit course program. Cheryl, we'll let you take it, take it from here. All right, thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to be with everyone this afternoon and talk about some of the ways that we use Blackboard um, to really, as the title says, kick it up a notch. Um, I've been in the Capture Parish um, School District my entire educational career, 43 years. Uh, of course, I started when I was 10. And uh, I have taught there, been a school principal, and for 20 years I've been the chief technology officer for the district. <clears throat> Early in my career um, as the chief technology officer, I, I knew that we needed to seek a way to collaborate, to reach out, to connect our teachers and students in different ways. So we've been using um, Blackboard and many of their tools uh, for almost 18 years, an early adopter in the K-12 market. And so we're delighted to be asked to uh, talk to you about what we've been doing we, that we think does kick it up a notch um, for learning. Uh, the program goal for the program that's a kind of a new thing for us, uh, we began it last year, we're in our second year this year, is twofold. It's really to help student earn college credits. Um, we have two courses built that I'm gonna to talk to you over the course of this afternoon that are specifically tailored to apply in a college of education um, course work while students are in high school. Um, the, the main goal is to build a pipeline of educators. We are no different than most of the districts in this country that are beginning to experience uh, a lack of highly qualified teachers entering our workforce. Um, back in the day when I was beginning in education, there was an abundance, really an overload of teachers. Well, that has changed and today 
we are having to recruit in new and different ways. So we felt like using this dual credit course to lure, to, to really uh, seduce young people to come into the teaching field and give them six credit hours while giving them uh, an in-depth view of what being in a classroom, teaching and learning could be, was really a win-win for students um, in, in their senior year of high school, but also um, a very significant win-win for the district. To start off to show you just a little bit of data, um, when I began many, many years ago, we had 356 students graduate. Um, in the fall of 2015, you can see we had uh, 46 entering. We had in the spring 57. This past fall, we had 40. This spring, we had 52. In the fall, we're estimating we'll have 43 students entering uh, as education majors. That is nowhere near the number of students that we need to fill our classrooms. And regionally kind of showed you what happened fall and spring of 2017. And these are hard numbers that we can get our hands around, but really the numbers are much higher than this because sometimes what principals do is when someone leaves in the middle of a semester, they put in a long-term sub, six weeks here, six weeks there, continuing to try to fill a classroom uh, knowing that there's not a certified teacher to take that. So we haven't had our estimated needs for the fall, but we anticipate they're going to be higher before. So this spring, we had 12 in Calcasieu Parish, and that's an interesting number because it's probably twice that in an informal number. That's the formal positions that we had to fill with non-certified teachers. So our local community college um, is growing in their enrollment, but many of those students are going into the petrochemical industry. They're not entering the field of education. So again, a win-win for us building this online course and um, luring students to the College of Education to matriculate and then to come into our classrooms uh, four years later. The program components that I think um, will be interesting for you to know is that in this late spring, which is right now, um, we recruit high school juniors to begin their first course when they are a senior. Um, that's done with our counselors. It's done with our school principals. Um, it's done through a variety of uh, career counseling opportunities that go on in the high school over time. And so once we've identified a core group, a cohort of students that we are going to enter into the program and interestingly enough, pay the full tuition to the university for them. So it's, um, it's a no cost uh, step up into the teaching profession for them with six hours. We hold our first orientation meeting in late August. All the students come, many of their parents come, their school counselors, their proctors come. We talk about expectations for a college course. Um, many of these students haven't been in any dual credit, so we have to speak very frankly about what the expectations are for not only a college course, but also the expectations for being in a fully online course where you don't have a teacher every single day saying, did you turn that in? Um, have you finished that work? I'll give you a couple of extra days. So we talk about that and introduce the Blackboard learning environment. Some students may have not been in Blackboard as a student in earlier grades. So we talk about that. As I said, we offer two courses. Um, the first course is EdTech 245, which is uh, Educational Technology Foundations. That is our fall course that brings them in um, to the program. Then the second course is Education 204. That's an introductory level into education at our local university. It's multicultural and special education, and it's offered during the spring semester. Another kind of um, hand-holding technique that we've used is we've identified proctors at every school that are the key contact person for each student to assist them with their work 
all of my announcements, all of the information that I send out to students, I copy all of the proctors. Um, if I have a problem with students that seem to be lagging or not completing assignments or not responding um, to my emails, then I reach out directly to that proctor and quite frankly, what they do is just march down the hall and pull them out of class. Um, that's a real attention getting mechanism that uh, that has worked well uh, in both of these courses over two years now. So if we think about y'all, I'm at home during spring break, so I'm going to apologize for that phone ringing, but um, that's what happens when you're not in your office, you're in your home office. So if we look at that first course that I talked to you about, which is EdTech 245, um, a great deal of planning, a great deal of consideration went into the development and creation of these courses. Um, since this was the first college course that most of these students would, would experience, we wanted to make sure, of course, that the uh, the courses were pedagogically sound and were designed in such a format that would ensure their success and would build skills as they move through each of the lessons. We also wanted to create, um, for lack of a better term, a fun learning activity that would uh, be relevant and beneficial to help students see like, to see what it would be like if they were beginning a classroom experience as a teacher or in a practicum teaching experience and that would prepare them with tools of the 21st century, tools that we use in our school district so that they could have their own classroom. So the 10 lessons in this first course um, focused on, I think, something that's familiar to all of us, communication, collaboration, critical thinking and creativity, what we typically call the four C's. Um, here at the first bullet point, you'll see some of the things we talked about. We really stressed and worked on this ethical use of technology, uh, talked about bookmarking. Uh, I think you heard Jenny talk about this earlier, a personal learning network, helping them establish one, uh, digital storytelling, collaborative work, uh, multimedia and virtual learning. To do that, we use the tools that are in Blackboard for us, journals, tests, blogs, discussion boards, and wikis. We really stress the students collaborating and sharing information um, really across the district because we have students from all 11 of our high schools. Um, the students were selected on a proportional rate, uh, basis based on the enrollment in their senior class. Some students um, could have two or three members of a cohort, some got five or six based on a larger uh, senior class uh, enrollment. So if we move um, and think about the tools that we used in Technology 245, you can see some common technology tools, presentation tools, Prezi, Symbolu, uh, certainly Pinterest, Photo Story, and, and the list here of, of just a snapshot of what they might be experiencing in a classroom. Um, we presented every lesson in a learning module. I'm gonna show you one in a moment that'll give you uh, an example of how we did that to make it easy for students. Um, every assignment had a checklist so they knew exactly what they had to do, um, very similar to a rubric. And we tried to include student, uh, student voice in the projects and their last course was the construction of a portfolio, kind of a show your work uh, type of opportunity. In 204, um, we don't hold a student orientation because it's really the second course in the spring. And we have a video that we developed to provide an introduction and course overview, again, uh, using learning modules. And we divided um, that course, multicultural and special education, into three components, the history of education, philosophy of education, and an introduction to diversity and multicultural education. Now, these courses were developed, um, I wouldn't say in collaboration, more in cooperation with our local university, because we felt like we could build a better mousetrap and we feel like we built more engaged, more relevant courses, but we had to, um, 
use an example of one of their course the course syllabus for this course to make sure we had all of the right components and we did that but um we're confident this course is more anchored in relevant learning for what we want students to know entering our school district as first year teachers we also um, designed the content to prepare students to be successful on the praxis. The praxis is the Louisiana State Teacher Certification exam. It's that entry point that they must pass before they enter the College of Ed, uh, a portion of it, and then before they're certified, they has, have to pass another portion. So we wanted to make sure this content was aligned um, with the expectations on that test so that our students would have um, a very high success rate in taking that test. Also, another um, expectation of the university is that in this course, Education 204, this introduction, they must have 10 field experiences. They must schedule 10 classroom visits. Um, there's a field experience sheet that they must fill out, that they must um, upload into Blackboard that has uh, critical components they must include. They must go to 10 different teachers. And it is um, a requirement for passing the course. You can't miss one of these 10 classroom visits. So I found uh, last year, this was the point where I had to get some principals, uh, some school counselors involved, because some students thought, well, I have enough points. You know, kids are mathematical whizzes in figuring this out and they thought well, I have enough points if I don't do a couple of these I'm still going to have an A in the course well I put the um, quietus to that pretty quickly and so you know teaching a course more than one time you figure out where those little uh, learning opportunities are for the professor and certainly opportunities for students to try to uh, make the best of the situation so the 10 field experience is very important part of Education 204. Um, in the history of education, we used a variety of media, um, certainly videos, websites, PowerPoints that a lot of people use in courses, and a completion of a wiki that um, is a pretty powerful learning experience for students. Um, they, we provided them additional note making uh, uh, guides, as a study material, and quizlets to help them review. And each lesson had a 10 question quiz. So they had to really pay attention, follow the content and make sure they were taking notes. And certainly the Quizlets helped them see where their areas of weakness were. Then as we moved into the philosophy of education, students explore the major philosophies of life and education. We had them complete a self-assessment, determine their philosophy. That was very interesting for them to do. And then they had to engage in a discussion in the discussion board about their findings and reflect on other students' findings and compare and contrast them again. Um, a powerful uh, collaboration and learning experience for students. In Education 204, um, we, uses, we used a lot of different mediums to present this information and one that I put there for your um, reference uh, there was a video distraction and an audit auditory distraction which came out of the PBS documentary misunderstood minds um, you can google that and it's available at YouTube and it allows the students to see what it's like to see and to have a visual disability and to have an auditory type of distraction. Um, again, a very powerful experience for students to learn about disabilities um, and to develop a little bit of uh, empathy towards students that they may have in their class. And then they had to develop a presentation on an assigned disability and, and speak to that. Again, part and parcel of the whole project-based learning experience that we put in these courses. Um, an interesting thing about using this uh, diversity and this misunderstood minds is the fact that we broke it in, it was 90 minutes into shorter chapters to help them 
um, also in the fact that you have to take into consideration that students that are not in a course where they're taking it during the class day, where they have access to a highly reliable uh, broadband experience, at home they may not have access to that. And so we had to make sure that um, we broke it up so that if they didn't have a high speed connection, they'd still be able to view everything. Um, as I mentioned before, um, we use learning modules. Each lesson is presented using a learning module. This is a very easy way for students to navigate through a lesson. All the links to the Blackboard tools are embedded. The students can navigate page by page. It helps them clearly see what it looks like and it keeps them on, a, um, on the correct pathway. Now I'm gonna do some experimentation with you and I'm gonna share um, one of the courses. So just kind of hold on here for a second. Let me bring that up to bring this up for you, share the entire screen with you. Okay, I think you should be able to see that. Mm. Jenny, can y'all see my screen? It's coming now, there we go, we see it. Okay, great, great. Um, this is lesson seven, I'm gonna take you up to lesson three and show you exactly how that looks like, and let me turn it's off. So you see the student view. So as you can see the overview and to the left, the table of contents, this helps students not get lost. What we found, certainly students that are in high school, um, maybe for the first time experience in an online course, helps them with this pathway as they move through the lessons um, where the overview, and then it tells them very clearly uh, to get started, click on the Prezi project. They click, they go to the very next portion of it. And you can see up here in the right-hand corner, they know where they are. It's page two of five. They move through this. They looked at all the resources. They see what their uh, project is going to be graded on. Um, it tells them, and then it tells them at the very bottom, click on posting the Prezi. So they go right back up. It might seem... Um, you know, pretty simple to those of us that are we consider ourselves uh, online experts. But trust me, with a 16 or 17 year old high school student that hasn't been in an online environment other than on their phone, texting or Instagramming, um, this is very, very helpful. And it's it's another pathway to ensuring success in a fully online course with students that I never meet with them. So this tells them about that, and then it. You know, it, it tells them, go through. The next thing is their quiz, um, where they click to launch. And then the last thing that they're responsible for is the journal that they create. So we have found this methodology of using the learning modules, giving the students a clear pathway from A to B to C has helped ensure success in this pretty rigorous online course that's giving them not only a high school full Carnegie unit for one semester, but also a full college course credit for a semester. So I'm going to ask, we're going to go back now and we're going to talk about um, the Blackboard component of announcements for just a moment. And let me stop sharing so that you can take us back to the presentation. I think Claudine's going to do that or Jenny's going to take us back. Yep, hang on one second and I'll grab the right slide for us. And here we go. Great. Um, this seems pretty simple, but I would share with you that I think the Blackboard component of announcements is very, very powerful. First of all, it's easy and it's in incred incredibly beneficial to be used in a course for students. Um, it helps the students realize that there is somebody out there in the internet world um, that's paying attention. Um, it encourages students, it reminds them of deadlines. Um, a neat 
trick of Blackboard is anytime you post an announcement, I'm sure you know it immediately sends an email. Um, I post announcements frequently. Another tip that I use is I have them all stay there because I will have some very smarty pants students say, well, I never saw that. I don't know what you're talking about, Dr. Epshire. And so I will just refer them back to the announcement and have them scroll down and look at that. And they will go, oh, I, yeah, I must have not seen that. And then I remind them that I also sent them an email, even though students believe that email is for old people. Um, in a course, I tell them that it may be for old people, but you're not going to get text um, in my course. You're going to have to read emails and you're going to have to read the announcements. So uh, as to the question, how often should an instructor post an announcement? Well, I, that's kind of like a rhetorical question, but I don't think there's a magic number. I think you have to post an announcement whenever there's anything that you need to get students' attention for. Because as the announcement scroll, it's the most current one at top. So every time they log in, that most current announcement is there staring them in the face. And it's a, it's a piece of accountability, I think, for an instructor. And also uh, keeping them all there and not having them disappear or be hidden is a, is a strategy we use in all of our courses. So the next thing we're going to talk about is another powerful component is blogs and journals and discussion boards. These three Blackboard tools are integrated in, the, in, in all of our courses to assist students in collaborating and deepening their knowledge based on the input of others. Um, they're going to have to do a lot of work in college or university around collaboration, project building, um, you know, and reflection. And so we used, and you're going to get this deck, so you're going to be able to use these link, but these were two articles we found very helpful that I thought would be a, a reference for you in figuring out which tool to use in what portion of the course. And um, they're great articles. They come out of uh, a couple of uh, universities that have posted a lot of information on training. And of course, as we do in K-12, we all share. We borrow good information and we share with each other so we're not reinventing the wheel. But I thought these were two great resources that might help some of you that might be uh, viewing this webinar um, either today or in the future. Um, another thing that I'd like to talk to you about um, is, is us requiring a journal entry at the end of every lesson. Um, we just felt like that our students needed to articulate in writing um, what they've learned from the lesson rather than, oh, I took a quiz, I did a great job, I took a little test, on to the next thing. We provide guiding questions so students have to reflect and articulate about key components that we want them to know that were brought forth in the lesson. Uh, of course, we found that we need a rubric for every journal, even to the point as we modified from the first time we taught the course to the second, to the point of telling them how many sentences. Because in the first course, we were like, uh, you will create a fully developed paragraph that discusses the following things. Well, some students think two sentences is a fully developed paragraph. So Dr. Abshire had to articulate to them that that would be five fully developed sentences for a fully developed paragraph. And you know, that's okay. I get it that students are busy and that they just want to move through content, but this is a college course and, and we are serious about building capacity in students that one day we hope will enter our classroom, our classrooms as outstanding young teachers in the profession. So we, we've pushed the envelope and we've built a lot of rigor into these courses. I think uh, it's important and it's certainly important if we're paying the tuition. So the next um, uh, slide is an example. I thought it'd be interesting for you to see an example of what one of the journal uh, topics looked like uh, about the importance of learning history and edu education. And we found some, what we felt like were interesting quotes for them to think about. And then in this journal, they had to select one of the quotes 
to talk about why it was important. And you can see we said a paragraph of at least four sentences. Look back over your note taking sheet, find one event from European or colonial section, write a paragraph, again, four sentences, uh, explain the reason and the person and how it's helped shape present day American education. Um, again, a push for them to think critically about what they've read, what they've learned, and make them express that in writing, certainly grammar and um, punctuation and good sentence use are a part of the grading and it only takes a couple of times for them to figure out that they cannot type with their thumbs like they do on their phone and not capitalize. And then they get the hang of the fact that working in an online course is different than uh, texting to your friends. And I think, I think it's important that that's part of the learning experience for students in an online course. Um, an example of what the assignment criteria looks like that they see in the rubric that's posted, which just mirrors what was in the um, previous slide, but I, I thought that might be interesting for you to see exactly how it looks like in the PDF that they have in every course that is the assignment checklist is what we call it. I um, also thought you might like to see a student example of what one of those journals was. And as you can see up at the top, I uh, had to white out the student names in terms of personally identifiable information. All of us know with uh, students in K-12, that's an important piece of uh, us putting things in the cloud and certainly us sharing any student content is that we have to be respectful of that PII. And so there's the quote in the event and the person. And um, we've been very impressed with some of the reflection from our students and we're um, hoping and praying that they become teachers in our school system because we think we have a good handle. Uh, they have a good handle on the content that they've learned in these two courses. So as we move through um, another important component for us has been the discussion boards. Um, many of the lessons in both of our courses utilize discussion board uh, features in most of, most of the learning modules. Um, students are provided with specific criteria. And as I said before, you know, being a 16, 17, 18 year old, they're probably not a strong online communicator other than uh, texting with their friends and it's a very different format in social media and a different way to communicate online and certainly a different way to communicate in a college course and the expectation is higher. We even um, share with them that they have to respond to another classmate depending on the lesson. Sometimes it's one or two other classmate postings they must respond to. And, and we had to tell them, we learned, we had to tell them, you can't say, good job, great posting, I agree. It had to be a, a reply that would encourage further discussion. And once we did that, we saw um, really our discussion boards explode and become powerful and reflective and students really thinking and questioning each other. And, and, and to me as a professor, um, that was exciting to see students questioning other students' thoughts. Um, it, it showed them that uh, really they were vested in the conversation and they were interested in the discussion. We saw um, more than the required postings, more than the required two or one. Sometimes we'd see students posting three and four and five, having a discussion that went back and forth, either defending what they had written or com, uh, continuing um, to push the envelope and question why did they feel that way. And, and we knew that we were onto something good when we saw that. Um, blogs, um, we've used that on a limited basis in our course. We just found it's a little more difficult to grade if these comments are, are part of the grading criteria because we can't do inline grading of comments. So while blogs are, we feel like are less confusing for students to follow, 
we found that the level engagement wasn't as deep in discussion boards and for the most part they only did exactly what they were required to do when the discussion board we saw that reflective practice and that uh, conversation uh, far beyond the norm although we are using blogs and we and we do feel they're important in the uh, in the scheme of learning uh, in this course um, we also had test knowledge content acquisition and we used test questions that were formatted to resemble uh, the way materials assessed, uh, assessed on the praxis test. And so that we feel like as we move forward in this path and our students are graduating and entering the College of Education, we're hoping to get good feedback from them on how they felt like they were better prepared, more well prepared, perhaps than some students that weren't in our courses. Of course, that's yet to be determined, but, but we feel like we have a good handle on that. Um, the wiki component of Blackboard um, has been very powerful for us also. Um, we wanted to show students as an example of how they can use student collaboration in a project. We wanted to show them um, how to work together in groups so in EdTech uh, 245, we had students work together to create a wiki about their school. And then they had to go back and read the other wikis and comment on at least one other group's wiki. Again, we saw students, we see students commenting on, some students commented on every school's wiki. Um, they were shocked and amazed to learn about the other schools. Kids in high school get so focused on their school mantra, their school winning the football game, all about my school. It was very exciting and rewarding to see students interested in the other high schools in the area and saying, oh, I didn't know they taught those kind of courses there. I didn't realize y'all had this, so do we, or we don't have this and I wish we had that. So um, we felt like that was a great learning experience for them. Then in Education 205, um, they were assigned a particular topic to research, uh, you know, to American education from the Revolutionary War through the 20th century. And then they had to use what their what other students had researched on all these critical components. And they had to complete a note taking sheet because they were going to have a test on that. So that was another powerful use of a wiki that was very beneficial to this for learning, but it was beneficial to the students for assessment. This is an example of what that wiki assignment page looks like. Um, their wiki had to address the following bullet points there. Um, we did not let them create the wiki. We made a page for each group, which we felt like was a way to simplify the use of the wiki and expedite the use so that every student knew they had to be in that one wiki and work together. Um, they wanted to see uh, about how each other uh, classmates, what portions of the wiki, the questions they answered, and then they had to work together and edit each other's. This is an example of what one of the high school wikis looked like. Um, they, did a, they did a great job on this. I wasn't sure how well they would take to this creating it, but they really got into researching their school and learning about their school. One student even said, I didn't even know my school had an alma mater. And I thought, okay, check. At least the, the student has learned that his school has an alma mater now. And he, and he had to go look up the words. And one of them said, I had to go to the music teacher and talk to her. And she made me sing it with her. And I was like, good. This has been a, a, a good experience in more ways than one. So, so that's a sample of what one of the wikis looks like. Here is an example of what their participation, and again, as you see by the name, I had to white out from this screenshot all their names, but um, this is, it, it's such a wonderful component in Blackboard, this wiki, and so easy to grade because it tells you exactly, you know, what percentage of words they modified, um, how much they saved, what percentage, and so students knew I was gonna grade them on what their participation was in the wiki and some students didn't get a very high grade on it and they questioned me about it and 
I sent them back to look at what they'd done and some of them I copied and pasted and emailed it to them. And they said, oh yes, sorry. And then they realized they did get the grade that they deserved. So Wiki, another powerful tool that we found to be very beneficial. Um, this is what the Wiki looked like in the Education 204 project. Again, um, they had to post their research before the deadline for the other assignments because the students had to read all of the wikis on each subject area so that they could prepare their note taking sheet for the week in order to take the quiz. Again, you know, kind of staggered assignment responsibilities. Um, this is what that wiki project looked like. Um, off to the right, you'll see the topics that they were responsible for covering. Um, each student had to go through and read each one of those and fill out their note taking so that in a course that's just a semester long and has two major components, the history and um, the special education component, there was no way to cover all this. And in a face-to-face -face course, I don't know, I guess the professor would just stand and lecture the entire time or give them a book to read and, and, and test them over it. But the students have reflected and told us they felt like they learned a great deal about the history of education through other people's research. So just a sample of what that looks like. And um, a sample of a student um, portion of what one of the students posted. Um, they had to cite their sources, uh, which is another good thing to get ready for college, uh, knowing that they're gonna have to cite sources and papers. Some of them are certainly doing that in high school. And um, in the assignment feature, I wanted to give you an example of what that field submission looked like, just as a sample. They had to submit using the assignment feature in Blackboard each of their field experiences, uh, all 10 of them. Um, at first, they found that a little bit tough at the beginning in the, in the first one they submitted, but they quickly got the hang of it. Again, this is the second course, so they were extremely familiar with the whole interface of Blackboard and the uploading and downloading portions of documents. So it didn't take but the first field experience and then they were using that assignment feature uh, very easily and flawlessly without any issues at all. Just to give you, um, before we get to the end here and we go to questions, we're right on time. Um, I wanted you to see what this statistics looked like. And I purposely, you know, I purposely put in the grades because I don't want to um, gloss over the wonderfulness of a dual credit online course to get students ready for education. As you can see how our numbers across the top in 15, 16, spring and fall, um, the first year we started with 43 students. I'm gonna be very forthright with you as I've been through this entire presentation. We recruited the heck out of students, um, trying to get a large number of students, getting counselors um, to, to coerce, to lure students into the course. And in retrospect, at the end of that fall semester, we figured out that we didn't get some of the best recommendations from our counselors that we didn't get students that were serious about being in an online course. And quite frankly, in the fall of 2015, I wasn't sure I was gonna teach that course again, as I told our director of high schools and our superintendent. So this is an example of you, you come up with a good idea because I thought this would be a great idea. And I told my superintendent, he goes, fabulous. That is a great idea. We'll pay the tuition and you'll teach the courses. I went, whoa, whoa, whoa. I didn't tell you this for me to do this. He says, oh, the university will pay you as an adjunct and you already know what you wanna do and you're, you're the one. I said, I'm not the one. He said, you're the one, that's why you got your PhD to teach us, that's not the only reason. But ultimately, I did take on the challenge because it was my idea and, and I knew that it was a benefit. But we started with 43, we have 11 high schools, all schools were represented. You can see we have three Fs at the beginning that first semester. Those students no more wanted to be in an online course than they wanted to fly to the moon without oxygen. And so I did everything short of going to their mama's house and fussing at them. 
counselors, principals involved, could not get those kids involved. They, they just wouldn't do the work. Then, so we cut some students. The second semester, we had 38. We had four Fs. Again, I'm going to be very forthright with you. One was just a straight out F for not doing the work. Three failed for what I call uh, copying and pasting. I do believe sometimes that high school students believe that those of us in a fully online course, we're not going to read every word that they write. Well, that was um, a mistake on their part because I read every word that they wrote and we have three students that plagiarized other people's work and with the willingness of another person. So two copied some one person's work and one person gave it to them in terms of their field experiences. So I did go out to the schools. Um, I met with the students, the principal, the counselor, and um, being an elementary teacher, I went up one side of them and down the other. Uh, and I always believe that you get students' attention when they start crying. <laughs> and so I had all three crying. Not that I'm proud of that, but they were ashamed. And I think it quite frankly held them well into their college experience because all three of them are doing very well. And, you know, that's a life lesson. And I told them if the worst thing that ever happens in their life, they get one F because they, they didn't understand that plagiarism is a serious offense in an academic setting. So that's that's why you see those grades. And I, I think in starting out something like this, people should expect that. So this fall, we highly recruited and highly raised the criteria and um, inspected the credentials of all the students. And we have 28. We didn't lose any between the fall and the spring. You can see I consider those to be pretty good grades. That 1C, um, we got that student's attention. And so I feel confident that as where we are in the spring right now, uh, I have like 27, A, 27 A's and one B. Um, that student should be able to, could, could pull it up to um, an A if he works hard here at the end but we'll see what happens. But I, I thought that would be important for you to see, you know, the real true picture of, of what happens in a course like this with students. Um, to kind of close up real quickly, uh, my last slide is, what have we learned? Well, from the first year to the second, um, we set the due dates using the option in Blackboard and the, and the assignment closes at the due date. That really, really got students' attention um, because they realized that in a in a real college course, which this is, you don't you don't pick things when you want them to be turned in. Their assignments, their due dates, and you have to do them when they are to be turned in and when they are due. So we have worked. I do work with the counselors if there's some big thing going on in a high school, I can make an adjustment. The other thing we're going to do is we're beginning to track the number of students who are moving into the College of Ed. We want to recruit additional, and you see that underlined high achieving students. We want to make sure we're sticking to a very rigid criteria since we're paying the tuition. Um, we're using course evaluations to revise coursework as we move, move through it. And our plan for next year is to use the Blackboard portfolio feature and have them as they move through submit artifacts from each of the courses. So I have um, downloaded my brain to you on this topic. And so I think, um, ladies, we want to open this up to possibly some questions. There may be some there in the um, text box that I haven't been monitoring because I've been talking <laughs> excessively. <laughs> Cheryl, that was absolutely amazing. Um, so comprehensive and so authentic in terms of your, you know, the, the, the course inclusions and and results, and just a very, a wonderfully frank um, uh, discussion or, or presentation, I should say. So at this time, we will we're going to open it up to questions. Let me give people a couple of seconds here to uh, uh, to think about that, and I'm going to let I'm going to hand the reins over to Claudine to help manage a little Q and A with you. And in the meantime, I'll start putting, um, plugging in a couple of uh, helpful links into the chat for folks. But 
uh, definitely. Dr. Abshire is at your service, folks. Um, it, it is time for Q&A. If you guys are shy, you can type your questions in the chat or you can hop on the mic. Don't, don't, we don't want you to be shy and ask away. Um, I'm curious, Cheryl, having um, spent a lot of time in both brick and mortar and in online setting as a teacher, what did the face-to-face -face time look like in this course, if any? Because I know a lot of online, uh, my son's in college right now and some of his courses are completely online and it's really varies um, depending on the professor, on certainly on the interaction. Um, and in general, there's not always a face-to-face -face requirement, although he sure could use some. <laughs> well, um, being that I, my full-time job during the day is I'm the chief technology officer. So we decided early on that we were going to make this a fully online course. As I mentioned in the beginning, the only time I see the students, and it's not a requirement, that they come in the fall for um, this orientation and signing some paperwork, like a memorandum of understanding, which is if you fail the course, your parents have to pay it back. That's tough love, but um, it seems to work. But it's not required because some students have after school activities and jobs, so the counselors can get them signed. So uh, in the fall is the only time I see some of the students, other than the fact that if I have to go out to the school for some extraordinary reason, like the plagiarism piece, I don't see the students. I see their pictures when they submit a, a prezi about themselves, but it is fully online and that that is the criteria and understanding for taking the course that they understand. There is not going to be a course mama. Um, there's not somebody, somebody standing over them. It is just their counselor or their proctor if they get into trouble. But the majority of students have operated and moved through this very easily and with very, very high levels of attainment. So they have a proctor that's assigned. Is that so that they can take the course um, during the day assigned to a, a specific period? And what does that proctor do? No, um, the proctor is there in most in most of the schools. It's the counselor. Sometimes gotcha. it's a curriculum coordinator. It's just somebody for them to go to. Um, they don't have a designated period for the course. Uh, some students do have during the day and they go to the library or um, you know, maybe a, a classroom where a teacher has an off period that they know when they work. But most of the students have a full um, period day and this is done after hours like, they be, like they're taking an extra course awesome. at home. Awesome. And have you had pretty good feedback? Um, are you using the survey tool or evaluation tool to kind of get their, their feedback on the course? And have you made any changes based on that, if you are? Um, we've changed, um, we have changed uh, some of the timelines um, because students talked about spring break and of course down in Louisiana, Mardi Gras. And so, um, you know, after the courses, we get, we've gotten some feedback from them about timing. And so we've shifted and made some of the course, uh, some of the lessons given more time in it because it came during spring break or Mardi Gras. And we've built in some flexibility and been more cognizant of those dates um, because of the, 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 not the university course calendar, uh, but, all, but the school's course calendar. And so we have made some changes. We've also um, tweaked a few things in the content around the collaboration with the wikis and made some of the requirements uh, more, you know, more clear to them. Um, making sure that we were taking into um, consideration their understanding of the whole wiki concept. So yes, we have. We, we, we're paying very close attention to feedback because we want to build the best course we can. And we're about continuous improvement. Awesome. Well, I don't want to monopolize the question time. Um, I see some familiar faces here in the participant list. Do any of you ladies have any questions for Cheryl? Wait my mandatory seven education seconds. 
It's making Wait, those, them uncomfortable. <laughs> give them another seven seconds, and I have another one for Cheryl, or I have one for Cheryl as well. Cheryl, when I think about, now it's early yet to see how many of the folks make it through, um, decide on teaching as their actual profession once they come out of college. Are there provisions in place if they want a position, um, want to apply for a position at, at uh, CPSB? Will there be any kind of provision made, you know, for them having done this course program? Is it, you know, there's, there's, there's a hierarchy for everything, including the hiring process. I was just curious if you had taken the conversation that far yet with the rest of the administrators. Um, thank you. We don't have a formal process in place, but let me share with you as those students start to graduate, our, um, our chief operating officer who is over the personnel department has their names. He was a former high school principal before he came our COO. He is, um, in fact, he and I worked on our PhDs together, so we're very academically close. And he he knows what we're doing, and he's like, I'll need those names as they start graduating. I said, Shannon, you will have those names. Mm -hmm. I, I would I would say with a great deal of confidence that those students will be hired because. They have recommendations, certainly from me as their professor, but recommendations from um, the director of high schools, um, again, the COO, that know that these students have gone through these courses and they have, they have a very relevant perspective on what's expected in our schools and our classrooms. So um, if they don't get a job with Calcasieu Parish, it's just because they didn't apply for one. I think that's excellent. It just it just speaks to the collaboration at multiple levels within the district. Mm -hmm. and, and I tell them that. Um, in fact, our superintendent is at that opening in the fall, and he says to them, you're, you're taking these two courses with Dr. Abshire. We're pleased. We're paying for it. We have high expectations for you. And when you graduate, wherever you graduate from, if you're a certified teacher, you can come here and we have a job for you. So coming from the superintendent, I think that speaks volumes. It certainly does to the parents because I had parents come up to me and say, thank you for this opportunity. My student does want to be in education and we would like for them to work in Joshua Parish. I said, get certified, come back home. <laughs> All right, that is excellent information. Cheryl, we can't thank you enough for this presentation. Um, those of you who follow uh, with FITS and some of the other uh, webinars and other sessions we have available at Blackboard, this, you know, no doubt this will be a reoccurring theme as we want to spread the message that something uh, like this exists and is successfully completed. Um, let's see, I, uh, really you've been getting some positive comments, Cheryl, in the chat, so you can take a look at those while we kind of close, close out our session today. Um, thank you all for your participation as well. If you have, a, a, if you think about a question later uh, for this uh, for this session or have a presentation topic idea, uh, please reach out to me uh, and let me know your thoughts on on future bits presenters. Cheryl is a is a regular presenter for us, um, and we'll look forward to uh, you know hearing additional updates in the coming months and and, and so on and so forth with the uh, with the dual credit program. And with that, we'll say adieu. Um, I know Cheryl, you we're going to hang tight a little bit, but we'll go ahead and say goodbye uh, to the folks on the call um, from all over, and uh, we'll make sure we get this information to you, including a copy of the deck, the recording, and all of the links uh, will be to you within a week. Thanks everybody for joining us today. Okay, bye bye. Stay with us, Cheryl. I would.